Well, well let's just start there. Uh, Mr. Wakeford, any reactions kind of to some of those things I brought up in, in Mr. Sadow's response? Well, will it annoy the court if I actually come You can stand wherever you'd like. Okay. Um, I, I think we've we got to start with Hall. Your Honor, and I'm glad you, you pointed to that language because that was going to be the first thing I wanted to address today. Hall, Hall descends from a case called National Dairy, which it, it, the language in Hall says in cases like this, we're confined, we look at the, the charge conduct. That's what we look to. And, and, and Hall, of course, was they looked outside of the charging instrument to these other facts. Yeah, so it seems like that's not going to be an issue here because the state's not saying here's our entire theory of the case. So what, what stops us from doing an as applied first amendment challenge just based on the indictment itself? That's a limited one. And you, and you kind of have a leg up since you get to put whatever you want in the indictment generally. Well, that, um, and that's kind of the thing, is that when you look at the post-hearing brief uh, from the defendant, uh, and you actually look at footnote two, he, he's not actually asking the court to look at, at the well pleading uh, allegations in the indictment. He's actually asking the court to read out certain, certain words, all of which have to do with intent. Um, so footnote two on page two, he says, if, if, if it says something's unlawfully or knowingly or willfully done, uh, that's not a factual allegation the court should consider. So the, the suggestion seems to be, oh, let's, let's look to Hall. Hall says we can play kind of fast and loose with what the facts are. And in this case, what we want the court to do is read out certain language from the indictment, actually not consider it. Okay. Just look well, at let's say we don't get to that further step and, and we are just, just getting over that threshold, even if there was no footnote two. Any position at this point on can we make an as-applied First Amendment analysis of this? So it's, it's true in federal courts, it's kind of all over the place. Some courts explicitly stay away from it, and other courts go into it. We know that in this, in this defendant's case in D.C., actually Judge Chutkin explicitly went forward and made an analysis based on the allegations in the indictment there. Uh, but not every court does, and some federal courts stay away from it for a very specific reason, which is that there are still factual allegations which have to be settled by a fact finder for a jury. And the, the, the okay, reason... Looking at all the cases as, have you, that you found, ones that didn't do it, I know generally they're going to say we don't have the record, we don't have the facts, but there, were there any that explicitly said, even though I could just look solely at the indictment, I'm still not going to do an as-applied challenge? Well, I think that's how we get to a case here in Georgia, and it's a case Your Honor cited back in October when you explicitly ruled, I, I'm, I'm, we're not yeah. going to get into this. That was the, the 11th Circuit case, though, wasn't it? You're talking about... I'm talking about the major case, okay. which is the Georgia case. The major case is where they say, okay, this is a pretrial, as applied, First Amendment challenge, but essentially what this boils down to is an argument about intent. That's what the defendant's really talking about. And when you look at what the defendant wants to argue about here today, it's just saying, well, I was talking, I was just a guy saying things. I was just advocating. I was just speaking my mind. And so all of this is protected, and therefore the entire thing has to go away. That, and, and that is I a question. I think that's your, your, your strong argument, strongest argument on if we're, we're in the analysis of the as-applied challenge. I'm still just trying to get over and, and, and really understand the procedural element of it. Well, and, and that's what Major says, is that because that intent question has yet to be answered, and the jury is the person, who is the, the entity that answers that question, it's premature to consider this. It's, it, you can't say that the First Amendment has been applied, or that the as-applied challenge can succeed at this stage because there's still questions that have to be answered. But Major, I think it was like an overbreath. Uh, on terroristic threats, right? It begins with overbreath, but then it moves into an as applied challenge. That's the last part of the major. Did they actually say premature, or did they just say denied? They say that they cannot say that the it's unconstitutional under the First Amendment as applied to the defendant in that scenario because there are still intent questions. That so, is, is, does that actually maybe suggest then that they did do an as applied challenge? It's just very hard for a defendant to win that because all you have is the indictment. That is a way that you could interpret it. It would, it would suggest that an as-applied challenge cannot succeed under the First Amendment because criminal, speech integral to criminal conduct is not protected. A well-pleaded indictment is going to demonstrate that speech that is fled as part of a criminal charge is integral to criminal conduct. And so there is no, there, there's nothing to decide if you're looking and you're cabined by the indictment. So we sort of have two routes here. Neither of them result in the grant of this of this motion. One says the court says this is premature. There's questions that have to be answered. Any First Amendment challenge has to happen after there's a factual record to look to. And the other says, okay, I can get to this today. It's not that I can't. I can, but there's nowhere to go because all of the speech is pled as integral to criminal conduct, and therefore it's not protected by the First Amendment. You could you could envision an indictment. I don't know if I don't remember if Alvarez was a post trial or pre trial thing, but you could envision an indictment where. Perhaps they drafted it to solely target speech because of its falsity or, or something like that. So maybe there's 
a use for an as-applied challenge in that kind of a situation? That's a fair point, Your Honor. It's just not the situation here. And it's not going to be the situation in almost any case. That was a special case where, of course, you have a very unique statute that was punishing. That was, but that was really a facial challenge, too, because it was, they were the it was saying, like, this is just punishing <laughs> falsity for falsity's own sake. Yeah. None of the charges in this case are about that. They are about falsity employed as part of, or, or statements employed as part of a, a, a pattern of criminal conduct in, in numerous ways. So there's nowhere to go, and so I, I, think, I think it requires dismissal or denial at this stage because you either can't reach it because there's more fact, there's facts that have to be established, or the indictment establishes that none of the speech is protected by the First Amendment, and the inquiry immediately ends. All right. Uh, all right, so back to you, Mr. Sadow. Uh, Let's let's move forward with the idea that we're making an as applied challenge solely confined to the indictment. Uh, this isn't a facial challenge. You're not saying any of these statutes are on this face Correct. unconstitutional. Uh, and your argument is that this is this is core political speech. Correct. Um, so 